and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And there is no Joe at the other end of the series of tubes and wires we call the Internet. We recorded episode 300 last night. And uh, we tried to record episode 299. Joe has a new schedule. And uh, we ran into the technical difficulties. And because we are recording out of order... <laughs> We decided, well, we've got a fill-in episode. Let's just use the fill-in episode. So here you go, ladies and gentlemen. Episode 299, a fill-in episode with uh, myself, Joe, and our pal Butch. Well, believe it or not, kids, we, we, we're we firing up again. Not only do we have the dreaded deadline doom, but we have all kinds of technical issues. <laughs> So, uh, if this episode is one you're hearing, it means Corey screwed something up. Hot damn. And you're Corey broke something. Trying to blame me. Good riddance. Oh. Or somebody broke Corey, one of the two. <laughs> Hard to say. But, uh, Joe, you've been reading the book, haven't you? I did. It's the one you read two years ago called Marvel Comics, The Untold Story by Sean Howe. 400 pages and no drawings. No drawings. Two Where's my comic? No drawings? drawings? I got the paperback. I picked it up uh, a couple weeks ago. Where was it? Price books. What do you remember about this here book? Uh, you know, the one thing I remember. And you also had some. Um, the, the thing I really liked about the book is he actually sat down with people to get the stories. Um, he didn't just pull it from places. Um, Don McGregor talked about how he sat down with Sean Howe for a long time and discussed his time at Marvel. Marv Wolfman talked about it. Um, I. I don't remember if he interviewed Shooter or not, but the thing I didn't like about it was sure. it seemed to hop around in time a lot. It would tell a story, and then tell what happened next, and then go back and tell something that happened at the same time, and it, 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 it kind of felt like patchwork. But the stuff he did have, especially when it gets into uh, Marvel in the 70s and Marvel's huge financial troubles and how they were driven by the fact that Marvel was, by, I would say, 74, completely unmanageable. Yeah, he and talked the other... about that. And there was something I was going to ask you about, because you know we talk a lot about the 70s books, and we have in the past. But first, let's, let's get some ground here. Uh, Corey, when were you born? 65, same as I? <gasps> uh, it, <Not> a... Close. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah. we were going another 25-minute okay, sojourn. What wouldn't we you <laughs> uh, 68, my birthday is next Saturday. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Wait a minute, wait a comic? minute. If your birthday is next Saturday, and this is a fill-in show, so it may not show up till December. Uh, yeah, get Dr. Doom's time machine, and we'll straighten yeah, it out. Boy, it okay. Been really good for Marvel, didn't yeah, are we... To get time By the way, Marvel, time, Marvel. time is still your broken. First, uh, what was your first Marvel book? My first Marvel comic was Marvel Tales number 59, which I did not know at the time was a reprint. It was the first part of the story with the Prowler. What year? 1975. I did not. I read a lot of comics before then, number. but I didn't like okay. the superhero was, stuff be, because it was all it was drawn with a lot of shadow. And for some reason, as a kid, that kind of freaked me out. I wanted. I like the clean line art of the Harvey and the the Dell and the uh, the Archie books. And what what age was that? What year was that? Uh, Seventy five was when I finally said, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read these books because college students read them." Yeah, it was seventy five for me too, but it was just because they were cool. I mean, I was a pretty I was pretty young. I think I was six. And I talked a lot about mine was Amazing Spider Man one seventy eight. Got it as a Christmas gift that started me. And I'm not sure when that was. That had to be 78, 178 was probably 1977. Yeah, because the other one that I have is Star Wars 2, which we you know obviously came out then. So basically anything before 75. Just, yeah, just that. Out. All right. You want me to take the trash out? or It seems to be yeah, just we'll full just... of pages for well, I think it might be comic. important to talk a little bit about what was going on. Absolutely. Stanley, uh, Stanley what, what had stepped back from being editor-in-chief, and he'd been editor-in-chief since the 40s. No, what I want to talk about is not 
what was going on with Marvel, because if you care, you can go read the book. What I really want to talk Marvel. about is kind of parallel what were we reading as the events in the book were going on. You know, well, that's just crazy talk. It is crazy talk, because it's all about comics. Uh, it doesn't sound good, man. Oh, no, it doesn't. Mark Butch, I think Joe's lost his mind. So I, I have. Yeah, when did this happen? As a matter of fact, we're 1990 what? Did you guys buy that Kiss 1987? Comic? Yeah, I bought the Kiss comic, and I bought it at John's second, uh, John Annunziata's second St. Paul comic location, which was even closer to my uh, dingy apartment on Rice Street. I, you know, I know I bought it, but I think I remember seeing it at a newsstand. Yeah, I think it had been out for a year or so I, before I got it. I had it. a choice between Kiss or a, a Superman family that had Superdog in it. Yeah, and yeah. I liked Superdog. And the horse. And, of course, my mom, being really, you know, religious, didn't like <laughs> Kiss. So she's like, I'll get the Superman comic. I'll buy it for you. So, you know, which is important because I didn't spend my own money. Right, yep. But Way I to play the angle. Up, I'm pretty sure I had. I must have picked it up at John's later. Because I, I know at the time. Speaking of your money. Actually, you know what? Hey. Here. Oh, I can use that as a bookmark. Yeah, here you go. Or tear uh, it up wait, and throw in the garbage. The cans. I think I bought it at, at uh, Twin City Comics, uh, or one, one of the shops, the early Greg Ketter you shops. You make up your mind. Because they talk a lot about making the Kiss comic, and about, about how, uh, I believe, was it Gerda that wrote it? The Kiss comic, which was a full, which was magazine-sized. Which was... I mean, what was it like? Comics for twenty five cents, and it was a buck fifty. I brought it to a big sleepover crazy. at a friend's house, and we all jumped up and down on top of it like maniacs. It's one of the few comics that I bought that did not get well taken care of and really got trashed. <laughs> oh my god! And I feel my bad. God. It, mine was terrible. I mean, I had all the other ones. My Beetle one too was bad. I think mine ended now, up I... also having the uh, genuine blood of some of my friends. Not only Kiss, but uh, a whole bunch of us. But also. what's interesting is the the, the book here. Claims that the, they went to go get the Kiss blood, yes. but there was a mix-up somewhere, and they think it ended up in the Sports Illustrated, not actually in the. <laughs> oh my God! And they they ended up with the six million dollar man's blood. Oh, <laughs> wrong blood, wrong blood. Did you get? No, it was uh, Chrissy Brinkley's br- blood, and it was, was it was young blood. The, it was going to be in the uh, Sports Illustrated. <laughs> now here's the weird thing: I did not read it till Marvel reprinted it as a trade paperback in the nineties. Yeah. Because I was not a Kiss fan, and I certainly wasn't going to spend a dollar fifty on a comic about a band I didn't much care for. Oh, you're nuts! Even though it was in the Marvel Universe, yeah, even though Doctor Doom was in it. I know. Well, let's see. I could have bought that, or I could have bought six regular <laughs> copies. <laughs> six Richie Riches. <laughs> oh no! At the time, it was uh, six Kirby comics. Oh, I was going to say Howard the Duck. Where Kiss also, that's where they first appeared in Marvel, was in the Howard the Duck, I guess. Yep, they were in Howard the Duck when uh, Howard was in a insane asylum. That now makes they sense. They talk about that makes sense. how most comic readers or retailers, because they were ordering this stuff, totally missed the boat on Howard the Duck. The book came out, sold out, and there were no copies <laughs> to be found in, anywhere. Just that $20 one on the wall at the, every comic shop and, uh, they yeah. went to. And I remember yeah. talking with John at St. Paul Comic, and we were talking about, you know, just how crazy the Howard the Duck was. And what wasn't covered in the book, which I thought was interesting, he's like, yeah, well, you know, we all jacked <laughs> up on Spider-Woman, figuring, hey, Spider-Man, yeah, Spider-Woman, that's right. that's he's selling right. him like a two bucks a pop. Meanwhile, Howard the Duck comes and place goes insane over it. Even with Spider-Man on the cover, right? Am I right? He was. They have a little... Blurb in the corner. history in the making. I don't have that book. Because of course, See, the other, thing that was Team Marvel Team Up. What I thought was really strange when I was a kid is when Howard the Duck number one came out. I I wasn't buying collectors books. I, there wasn't a comic shop within 500 miles of me. But somehow we all knew that Howard the Duck number one was worth a lot of money. <laughs> really. Yeah. yeah, and one of my friends had a copy, and he treated it as if it were gold. It's like, oh, I'd like to read that. Oh, no, no one touches gold. this. Gold. And then Marvel Howard reprinted Duck. it in the uh, Howard the Duck uh, Treasury. Mm-hmm. So I, of course, had to buy that. Was it the- And that Howard the Duck Treasury was... You know, think about it now. If they put out a trade paperback of a character who'd only been in like five comics, didn't the Howard the Duck Treasury have a lot of uh, original material in it no, too, the, as uh, opposed to other? Defenders. 
The Defenders did? Yeah, that had it like an original Howard the Duck story. Oh, is that where it was? They did that to yeah. try to get uh, Gerber back on Defenders. Because one other thing the book always covers is as, as time went on, just how the new regime would come on and just crap on the old regime. Mm-hmm. Now, <laughs> this is where I want to talk more about just what was going on with Marvels in the, in the 70s. Because as we jumped on... You know, we didn't have any clue just what the hell was going on. Oh, man. No, not at six years old. No, I just saw no, neat no, things on the rack. Uh, next Spider-Man come up. I don't think I remember reading about Warlock until later on they reprinted Warlock in, like, those $2 yeah. treasury or uh, whatever they were. Yeah. The uh, uh, Baxter reprints. And I love those. Which, I mean, they, they badmouth it in the, in the book here. But I'm like, dude, what? I loved it because... It let me, I knew yeah, about Warlock, yeah. but it was the only way I could read the story yep. because those early issues Oh, you couldn't, crazy. yeah, you couldn't get your hands on a, all of those. Didn't it, did those reprinted two issues per? Yeah. Per, yeah, okay. Yeah, those were pretty nifty. But, and this is where I think, what nifty, I say. we were talking about earlier, I hadn't realized what a nuthouse Marvel was because <laughs> these guys would come in, I mean, like, like Thomas and Starlin, The bullpen. Like, I'm going to edit my own books. And it would be like, books would be late, they'd have fill-in issues. You're going to do it the con way. And they talked about how if a book was late, the printer would slap Marvel with such a big fine for tying up everything that it would remove profitability oh, of the issue. And this is all right when Corey and I were starting to get them. And, and yeah. we wouldn't have, again, I was, I was pretty young, but you know they had the bullpen page and the letters page, and that, that was all meaningless to me. Oh yeah. Um, oh, I I, were, I read that stuff like it was the Talmud. Yeah, well, it was it was quite a while I, before I got for that. This time for to check out. And, and yeah, yeah. In Hollywood. Goodbye. And in '75, remember the they had the subscription page. It wasn't just oh here are the yeah, books you can yeah. subscribe to. It was an entire page full of everything Marvel was publishing at the time, it's a subscription, as well as huh? as well as books that they were planning on coming out. And they're like, all mailed flat. <laughs> Dead of Night with the Scarecrow. Yeah. And all these yeah. books that never came out. <laughs> and I remember picking it up going, there, I want to read all of them, but there's no way. I, I, don't, my, I can't talk my parents into buying this many comics. Oh, we make frowny face. Oh, I just I remember <laughs> my first job was at uh, House of Wong in Roseville. Boing. Every week, 30 bucks. Gong. Or two bucks. 30 Welcome bucks every two weeks, sorry. Bar. That was my comics. Oh for everything. my god, that is back then. And that does, 20, 30 bucks doesn't sound like. A, a yeah, yeah, you could load up. And I oh, still couldn't terrific. get everything. I mean, I just don't recall. You know, they were talking about books like Master of Kung Fu. Uh, what was the one with Scarecrow you just mentioned? GI Joe. Night? No. Later. Dead of Night. Dead of Night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Warlock, Strange Tale. I mean, none of this was on my radar. I don't even recall seeing them on the newsstand or the comic shops. Cause at the time I went to Ketter shop. So I actually started buying comics in comic shops. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, Spider-Man, Hulk, Superman, this crazy thing called X-Men. Ah, put it back. I have no idea what he's No, doing. no, no. Put it back and get Godzilla. Did you guys ever, I mean, did you buy this stuff off the newsstand or did you just pick it up like much later in life? It depends. There were some comics that I my parents bought for me. My dad would, on Sundays, he'd stop at the grocery store to get the Sunday paper donuts, and if I'd been good, he'd pick up a handful of comics. I also had a babysitter <laughs> whose um, boyfriend read stuff like Warlock and Man Thing and Kill and Black Panther and Kill Raven. And when he was done with them, he used to throw them away. But she said, oh, give, give him this kid I babysit. He really likes this stuff. So I, that's how I was able to get the stuff that Marvel was publishing that wasn't really aimed at kids like Spider-Man and Thor, more of the stuff that was aimed at the college student level. And so I'm reading Warlock at 12 and 13, and my brain is just going, whoa. <laughs> now, the question, do you... One thing, I, I, as I was reading through this book, it seemed like every time a new regime came in, the old, you know, they booted the old guys out. Usually it was, they just found out in crappy ways. You know, you're just out. You're, 
And it would struck me as kind of uh, like how Corey finds out he's going to have a guest on this. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no, it's not. <laughs> but kind of how Corey <laughs> finds out about everything in his life. A lot of these guys were like, so screwed up. I don't Corey's know. Got to pay. A lot of these guys are like bitching like crazy. Like, how dare Jim Shooter take away my self-editing ability or all these uh, other yeah, shit? Yeah. I'm like, yeah. The you kids did, want to read that book with me did, editing it. Such one, you did wonderful stuff at the time, but it wasn't making money. Nobody was buying yeah, it. Either. You almost took the company under because yeah, they got my quarter. They had, you know, they were groundbreaking, but these guys weren't disciplined enough. I mean, what type of image do you think they have? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was more than that too, because if you were editor in chief, and Roy Thomas is the one who started this, if you were editor in chief, if you stepped down, you kept the ability, and Stan would put it in your contract to edit your books. And in your contract, you would have a number of books that you would, you know, we're going to pay you this much, and for this much, you'll deliver this many books. Tell me this, of talking about editing books. All right, now you, you're you editing your own book. What yeah. are you doing? Back then, from what I have been told, you had the editor-in-chief, who was the guy who kind of oversaw everything. And what he did was basically kind of work between the publisher and everybody else. So he was the one who kind of was in charge. He was the boss. Then you had um, John Veerputin until 76, who was what they called the traffic manager. And his job was to make sure that the books came out on time. And there are... There are a bunch of stories about him in the Marvel, the untold story about how he was a nice guy, but he got in over his head and he was cutting people checks for work they hadn't turned in yet and and all sorts of stuff like that. But then the editor was the one who would be, all right, this is basically if you were editing yourself. Yeah. You know, you had a artist you worked with, but you were like, oh, okay, well, this is what I'm doing, and you'd approve your cover and all that. <laughs> I approve John, it. Well, John, John Ramita Sr. would be the one you'd work with the cover on. You'd go to John Ramita Sr. and say, oh, I want a cover with this on it. Ramita Sr. would uh, figure out who's going to draw it. Then he'd deliver it to you. You would make any changes. Underneath that were the people who were assistant editors, which was basically you were a proofreader. Mm-hmm. Now, because they were putting out so many books and things were so chaotic, Don McGregor's told the story constantly that he and Steve Gerber were both proofreaders. And because everything was so chaotic, they basically would proofread each other's books, and they were basically editing each other so that no one would tell them what to do. So they would deliver their books ready to go, and the editor would go, Oh, good, it's done, thanks, bye. <laughs> we'll get passed by the code, sure. Okay. Yeah, it's good, good, good. I'm out of here. So, if, if am I right? And as Shooter came in, he was the one that pretty much put a kibosh to all that. And when was that? When did Shooter sign in as editor in chief? Shooter came in after Archie Goodwin, so I think it was '78. Yeah. Okay. So because it was yeah, after I, we'd been in there for a while. Let me see if I can remember. It was Roy Thomas and Len Wein. Marv Wolfman and Gary Conway. The same week. Well, almost. I think Wolfman was only in the position for a month. Yeah, yeah. They, they basically got burned out and left. And then Archie Goodwin, and then Jim Shooter came in, and Shooter came in and wanted to run it like DC was run. Each editor has a group of books, and they're in charge of it. So he basically wanted to make Marvel like DC. Mm. Because he had worked at DC when he was a teenager, yeah. and that's what he knew. And the stories that both he and Gary Conway told of how crazy it was at Marvel. I mean, people were sleeping in the offices because they couldn't afford apartments. Um, that sounds great. Gary Conway told the story at one of the conventions where he came in and said, all right, I'm going to give this book to this person, this book to this person. And one he mentioned was Son of Satan. And he was told by one of the office staff, no, you can't remove the writer of Son of Satan. Why? Well, he's in charge of our coven. Our coven? What what, uh, what what are you talking about? This is an office. No, no, no. We have a coven. And he's he, he, he has to write it because he's in charge of the coven. Yeah. Think about how crazy that is. Uh, this is a place of work. Yeah. This is a publishing company. 
<laughs> You've got <laughs> guys got this, on the couch at a coven. Yeah. I got this quote from Thomas I want to talk about because he's he's talking about how because Thomas <laughs> or Shooter was uh, Goodwin's second hand man, you know. Yep, second in command. And he talks, I said that Jim wanted total power and that I could not and would not live with such a situation. Uh, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty ballsy because you get that attitude from almost everybody of that era. Well, I don't want to be, yeah, you know, so I'm edited by someone else. I'm on here. And they walked or got fired or were serendipitously removed. I mean, they, they talk like with Steve Gerber, how kept getting late, kept getting late, and then would find out, oh, you're not on the book anymore, pal. Uh-huh. I don't, yeah. And well, know, with uh, a me, lot of I them, found it hard and... to be sympathetic to the seventy creators because I'm like, you guys are fucking up, and we're not. You're not doing the job. Yeah, you got to play ball. Up. Yep, yep. You got to play along, man. I, I would think. But on the other hand, some of the shit they did, I would play along. Phenomenal. And one of the things that's not talked about much by the creators, but I remember it at the time because I. Once I found a comic shop, it's like, oh, wow, they have issues of the Comics Journal going back when the Comics Journal would actually have news and stuff instead of everything that's published is crap. But what it would be, it's oh, Len, Len, Len Wein's contract was up. Ah. He went in to negotiate with uh, Shooter, and Shooter would say, all right, you know, here's the contract we're offering you, and um, you'll no longer be able to edit your own books. Then over at DC, they would offer him more money, and basically it's, okay, we're going to make you an editor, plus you can have two books to write. So he jumped. Same with Wolfman. They, they offered him more money, stuff? they offered him an editorship, he jumped. Did they Roy do the Thomas. stuff for DC? I mean, they were late, just doing whatever? No. Because DC was a different machine. DC, you, DC, you were doing books six, seven, eight months ahead of time. Whereas Marvel, it's they were always up against the deadline from back in the fifties. They'd always been up against the deadline. And at DC, it's you're an editor, but you're not editing your own books. Now, a couple of the things that came out around that era. Uh, well, I guess the first question is, did you notice the changes? I mean, obviously, a book would disappear and you'd never see it again. Yeah. Did, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I noticed the changes because I, I could still point to on Spider-Man when Shooter took over. Because you had the big Marv Wolfman story leading up to 200. And after that, he was building up to something. And then you had a run of like a year and a half of stories that are just unreadable crap. <sighs> Yeah, there, there is one a single shot issue, fill of the month. You had Denny O'Neill doing one and two parters, and Denny O'Neill never understood Spider Man. Spider Man wasn't funny anymore. His supporting cast just vanished. Aunt May was 85. Well, Aunt May wasn't even in the book anymore. She it died. was okay, here's Spider Man versus Hydra Man. Here's Spider Man versus Sandman. And you had to wait till Roger Stern came oh, on yeah, before us. Yeah. Oh, wow. J. Jonah Jameson's back in the book. Um, you know, like a brand new day or something. It was just amazing. <laughs> so that was when Shooter took over. So his plan didn't uh, didn't work. Well, it did. For me, it, it did because I, mean, I was reading hell out of that stuff. Yeah, you know, issue after issue, and I was like, it, to me, we was, didn't know there was another way. There was the two parter with the punter. I didn't, and then just a bunch of man. Uh, and then the two parter with Juggernaut, and that's when it was oh, kind of, yeah, God. it got going again, you know. Yeah. Now, do you remember? I remember. This comic's at its peak for me, by the way. Jazz the two parter with the Juggernaut one when it came out, Jazz because one. it was like this is the first Marvel direct only book, painted cover. Yeah. People yeah. nosebleed over it. I mean, Gruber and I yeah. must have jumped all over this one. I right, get us ten, twenty copies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll be ready. We'll be I ready. bought it. You bet. I fell for it. Yeah, me too. What do you remember, Strode? I remember, as Shooter took over, I was ending high school, and there were a few Marvel books that I really liked. I really liked J.M. Matias's Defenders. I was hooked on the X-Men. Um, they were starting to talk about the uh, Marvel graphic novel. Uh, Micronauts had taken a hit in quality, but I still liked it. And then I noticed, oh, look, Roy Thomas and Gary Conway are over at DC. 
Oh, look. Here's George Perez and Marv Wolfman doing a book. Yeah, that's right. Oh, oh, oh. And I would still buy the Marvel books that I'd been buying for a long time. But more and more, the stuff I liked either was canceled or wasn't worth reading anymore. Master of Kung Fu got canceled, and Doug Mensch showed up over at DC writing Batman. Um, you know, Steve Gerber was uh, not in comics anymore. All of these things were happening. Yeah. And as I as I found direct sales um, stores, they had the Comic Spires Guide, and the Comic Spires Guide would would have you know news articles about oh this person went over to DC oh here's what's coming out in the future. Comics Journal would have news stories, and it, I still remember the big story Comics Journal broke. When Doug Mensch left Marvel, and he did a big interview with Cat Ironwood, that he had been in a meeting with Jim Shooter about Master of Kung Fu. And Shooter had said, you've got to mix it up, you've got to do something. The sales are, sales are dropping, do something, mix it up. Have him turn into a villain, and he's being hunted by a ninja. Kill him and have him replaced. You know, boom, 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 boom. And when Mint said, we can't do that. The other master of Kung Fu. And what Shooter told him at the time was, we're doing it with all the books. Captain America's going to be replaced by somebody. Iron Man's going to be replaced by somebody. Oh. Thor's going to be replaced by Good somebody. Idea. And everybody, you know, freaked out, lost their minds. And they Shooter went, no, no, no. Hydra. This is crazy. I would never do that. But look at what Marvel did at the time. Iron Man got replaced by Jim Rhodes. Huh? Thor got replaced by Beta Ray Bill. Uh, <laughs> Captain mm-hmm. America was replaced um, a few years later in uh, w- with that the Captain storyline. These were all things that were happening. It just didn't happen the way that Mensch thought they were going to happen. It was, oh, we're going to replace him for a while and then bring him back. Mensch, in the interview, was like, nope, they're killing off all of Stan. I would say by 91... Not, 91, 81, 82, You've got a lot of I knew what was going on behind the scenes. See, I didn't. A lot no. of this stuff... No, didn't I even care. Hear, uh, like I said, you know, Dazzler 1 was coming. Oh my god, it's big! Walt Simonson's Thor. It was like, oh, you guys gotta check this out. I mean, and a lot of it was probably John's self-interest. You know, point the kid to the hot book. Well, I had a oh, way of missing Thor's books awesome. like like Simonson's, the first issue of Simonson's Thor. Oh, yeah. You, you would, I, I never missed a week going to the shop, and yet I'd get there and uh, they're all gone. Anything cool that was coming yeah, out, you know? I think this was back when I had the same thing. I would just pick him up off the shelf, or like I'd show up and he had all the books laid out on his back yeah. issues, and well, I got to count them first. Okay. So I'd yeah. Walk back and look at something about 20 minutes later. All right, I'm ready. He hadn't touched it. He didn't count a book. Just take him out. <laughs> I knew I could count on you. Some of the stuff they cover in, in the Marvel comics, the untold story, with things like when Shooter would come down and the, the famous change, like on X-Men 137. But as the book went on, it sounded like Shooter went nuts. <laughs> I mean, he was well, like, well, this is only one way to do books, my way, and I know what's doing. And you're, and he would, get, he would minutia everybody to death to the point where, these guys all left. Yeah. yeah. Man. And a lot of it was, you have to remember that Shooter was trained in by Mort Weisinger. And Weisinger was notorious for just beating his creators up verbally. And Shooter was 13 when he started selling scripts Yeah, and he was about him. 30 as editor-in-chief, you know, deep into Yeah. It. So that's something to remember, too. So he'd been taught, look, you want to make a book better? You nitpick at it. You p- fix all the tiny things. You, 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 he would have Weisinger call him up screaming about a, a word balloon, that you know, <laughs> the phrasing was wrong. So right. Shooter would become very focused on that. And as editor-in-chief, he didn't have time for it. They were publishing too many books. That's why you had the editors. Who's this shooter now? And then he also was working, you know, he was kind of the corporate guy, too. He had to go upstairs and, and talk to people. But I think a lot of it was fed, too, with the, the commercial success, if not creative success, of Secret Wars. I've heard that a lot, that Secret Wars, 
is kind of when his head exploded. <laughs> and he would actually send copies to people saying, this is how to write a comic. And his book and go back and read it, and it's, it's shit. What? Yeah, that's how to write a comic? Yeah. Oops. And then it got even worse. It sold a million copies, when Butch. went into uh, Secret Wars uh, 2. This is how to gimmick a comic. <laughs> Now there's a couple there's a lot of different comics that popped up during this time. Some were licensing, some were others. And I want to get your guys kind of round robin opinion of them if you read them or not. Cuz as I was reading the book what, what kept me thinking is especially when they got up to the point when I started reading the comics is okay, here's what was going on behind the scene. What was I doing in the comic world? And I'll stop back at Dazzler again. You know, we're Oh, this is a big ass deal because Yep, yeah. You felt like you were getting in on the ground floor oh, yeah, of it, yeah. Something cool. This is the first time yep. they had a direct market only Ooh, yeah. to cover. The world's changing. It was crap. It's going my Wait, way. Was it crap? No. Yeah. Was nothing to write home about. I bought it. I remember them pushing and pushing and pushing it, and when I finally got it, it's like, this doesn't look good. The story okay. is boring, and the character's <laughs> nothing like she was in the X Men. Oh, yeah. wow, what a cover. Yeah, because she showed up in Spider Man. Again, yeah. Uh, it was probably two or three early two hundreds, two or six. I'm thinking two hundred, the two Punisher issues. Yeah, her maybe that one. Blah blah blah. Blah blah blah. blah yes. And then she had the X Men appearance, but they played yep. her off, you know, that she was a mutant, and then they took away the face paint. I think was the first thing they did, because originally that was her thing. They, she, Big she mistake. Been, yeah, it should have gone with the <laughs> Yes, just ask the Road Warriors. Yeah. How about? The, it all uh, comes back to the Road Warriors. Epic magazine. Did, did you jump on that? Oh, oh yeah, I, I did not. St- no, no way. No way. What did that cost? A buck? Forget it. I think it did. Um, I think it was more. Buck fifty. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> it was more because it was color. It was morbid, all right. And I had missed out on the Marvel black and white magazines, so they oh, to yeah, me yeah. were kind of like this mythical thing. And I was able to start getting Savage Sword of Conan, and I wasn't really a fan of Conan yet. But I would buy the black and white magazine and go, wow, this John Buscema art is so much better than when he's inked by Vince Coletta or Tony DeZungia. Oh, wow. One, uh... But then when Epic started, I mean, Stan did such a push job on that. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is the future of comics. This is going to be the greatest thing I don't, ever. I don't even remember it coming out. I remember Just it for what it's out. worth, you know. The first yeah. issue, of course, started with that wonderful Silver Surfer story. And then, I think, was Metamorphosis Odyssey part of that? Was that yes. an epic? It was an it epic, was. huh? Yeah. I mean, I to this day, I try to pick them up wherever I can. Yeah, oh, I have a bunch now. So, yeah. yeah, I'll just line them up and read them because they, it was fun. And then, of course, the epic comic line came along with mm-hmm. that. But, I, you know, there were some highlights in it, but it just it just didn't make a real marking lasting opinion you know for me i really was hooked on it and i'm looking at the stuff that was in it you had metamorphosis odyssey by by uh, starlin you had the first elric story by roy thomas and p craig russell you had um abraxas in the earth band by rick veitch which was the a- weirdest damn thing i'd ever read in my what? life it was the biggest thing you there you had, a, you had a weird world story i missed it read it all kinds of just, and then you had about, all of about, these kind of weird, trippy short stories that were just art focused. How about the epic comic line though? Because that was one oh, of the yeah. big things. As you get into the epic line, mm-hmm. creator owned, creator driven. Because a lot of times that was the carrot that drew a lot of these people back that got driven away initially. And it was another point where I felt like I was getting in on the ground floor and, yeah. and uh, you know experiencing all this stuff. And and I for me, it was Star. Oh, yeah. Starlet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dreadstar was there. Yep. I remember the short Void Indigo. Yeah. Yeah. Started with a trade with a Marvel graphic novel yep. and then two issues. And um, it was a big deal when that was canceled because it was canceled due to violence. I thought awesome. it was because of the last page. Sax and naked, violence. Naked, tattooed lady going, Rah! No, because of the violence in it. Canada would not allow it to be, wouldn't allow it to cross the border, and because of that, the sales weren't enough for it to keep going. And who wrote that dirty violence? That was Steve Gerber, oh, and believe Gerber. it or not, that was um, a reworked version of his Hawkman pitch to DC. Wow. 
in the early 80s. I didn't buy everything that Epic came out with, like Alien Legion. I didn't. Oh God, I did. I loved it. I tried it. Loved it. Really, that wasn't for me. Yep. Starstruck. I didn't care for. Uh, Great art by Chris Warner and Frank Scirocco and stuff. I mean, there was wasn't there Moonlight and Time Travelers or something? There was uh, Uh, yeah, there was Moon Shadow by J M D Matias, and I I loved him by that time. These days, still don't get it. Now, let me, uh, a couple at the time, too. Were you guys doing the Star Wars comic? No. No. I didn't like the art. I, I would say within a year or so after Return of the Jedi, I had quit reading it because it just felt boring. Nothing seemed to happen. So that was the other way around. I was just like, That's oh, cool. this is incredible because the story went on. I knew it was going to be a couple years till we saw the next movie. Uh, you know, we followed Han Solo, and I think that was yeah. If that's uh, when that Ron, if that well, and Ron Friends was on. Did he have a lengthy run on it? Yeah, yes. yeah. I thought uh, it was a good Better looking book for a while. I did like he that. Came on, he came on after Return of the Jedi, yeah. and it was very heavily inked by Tom Paul. Yes, right, right, right. I, mean, I did things, like the way it looked then. They had an issue where, like, I think Vader was torturing some rebel guy, and he coughed up the name Skywalker, and I'm like, holy crap, that was huge! <laughs> Vader oh, that was, did it. That was when the movies were coming out. I bought right it when the movies the movie, were coming out. Because this was all in between the first and second movie for us yeah. Yeah. old-timers. We call it Star Wars New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. I always just called it Star Wars. I know. It's, yeah. a, it's a New Hope, my ass. No. Did you pick up Battlestar Galactica? Yeah. Yes. No. I was, oh, I was on that, too. No. Nope. I did that the entire run. I was still a oh, superhero so- geek. It was funny, too. And still am. Win an, a year beyond this series being canceled. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was so much better than the TV series. <laughs> it was, huh? Oh, yeah, Walt Simonson That's writing and drawing. Right. Yep. Yep. You got to pick those up. That's right. How about uh, Shogun Warriors? It, it you ever read like a kid's ugly, book? Ugly, ugly, I ugly it. book. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> but at the same time, I was reading Godzilla, which was an ugly, ugly and book. Waited, yeah, yeah, but, it's like... yeah. But it, it's Godzilla. Yeah, well. Mm-hmm. Shogun Warriors, I had a friend who had the toys. Oh, yeah. And, you know, they weren't the greatest well, Zynga's toys. Zynga's guarding my garage as we speak. <laughs> and when <laughs> when the comic came out, I remember reading it going, this is a kid's comic. I don't want to read a kid's comic. And then you read Godzilla, and it's, oh, it's Godzilla versus S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah. All right, I'm down with that. But I picked up Shogun Warriors because Micronauts was a toy comic, but it was really, really good. That was the other one. Micronauts was just fabulous. And by the way, I would read any of this stuff now. Oh, yeah. All of it. Well, those first 11 issues of the Micronauts had the Michael Golden art, and how much Michael Golden art have we been given? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. You're just killing us, Mike. And it's You're all killing good. Us. It's all good. I remember when the NAM came out, it's like, well, it's not exactly what I want to read Michael Golden doing, but it's but Michael Golden. But it's Michael Golden, Golden yeah, it was something to look at. Now, one of the things they cover in the Marvel Comics book is Frank Miller and what he got away with on Frank? Daredevil. Miller. Because it was such a low-selling book, no, nobody cared. Doesn't ring a bell. And by the time they cared, it was too late. It was crazy. There you go. Yeah, you got to let people do stuff to I think get I results. Up when they did the, was it a two-parter with the Punisher? Because it was, oh my God, they're not putting uh, the coat on this because there's drug reference. They haven't done that since uh, early. Wow, Spider-Man. really, really? The code wasn't I, on one of those. I didn't. I didn't know. I don't recall the code not being on one of those books. Yep. Ah, huh, interesting. I even right. I mean, even as I sit here right now, I didn't know that. And one of the things about it that I liked at the time, even when and I, I was recently a, read it, even when I was a teenager, when they would make up a comic book drug, mm. it would annoy the hell out of me. <laughs> I and still they do that crap in TV shows now. You start stumbling I around like watched, a Zambi. I I just watched an episode of Hawaii Five O. And it's this new drug coming in, and people smoke it, and they die. Oh, whoa. Ooh, it's oh, that dangerous. Oh, i got to see this. That's pretty damn dangerous. And then there's this one where... I, I'm sorry, know, kids, but if, if it's a drug And I'm that, the cure. If it's a drug that kills you, um, <laughs> people are going to buy it. <laughs> uh, yummy. <laughs> That's why, you know, in... Um, what was it? In Daredevil, it was angel dust. In a couple other books, it was heroin. 
It's, oh, those are real drugs. When it's, uh, oh, we've got this new street drug, and when you take it, it makes you crazy, and you're locked up. First time you take it, well, then nobody's going to buy it, and I don't, don't treat me like I'm an idiot. Speaking of idiots, what did you think of Savage She-Hulk? Oh, boy. Again, another book that, oh, we got to get it. Oh, Dude, yeah. Stan Lee's what? writing it. I, I don't know if I even fell for that when I was oh, like, I she Hulk? Savage. I, Hulk. I didn't buy it. Dude. And when the, and then it got worse after the first issue. Well, and then they put it out late in an essential. An essential? It's yeah, essential. there's an essential. We're talking about the 80s, pal. And you know, going back and reading it, it's very much very boilerplate Marvel. Tons of dialogue, tons of people standing around talking, Mad. tons of mediocre Mad. art, Mad. Um, really heavily over in dart, boring art too. Yeah, me- mediocre, and you know a lot of standing around talking, and that's one of the reasons why I left Marvel and went over to DC what? because more and more Marvel was people standing around talking. And talking 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 and talking. I never caught on. I just kept buying and buying. Over at DC, oh, look, here's George Perez. Oh, look, here's Gene Cullen. Yeah. Oh, look, there's Keith Giffen. Don Newton. I'm not saying that I... Here's all these guys who have art where stuff's going on. I was on board when when New Teen Titans happened. and and It took me a long time to get New Teen Titans. I mean, and I love Perez's work. That was like a golden... I, I saw it like in back issues and price guides. Oh, Superman and Spider-Man. I oh, like, man. man. Yeah. It yep. took me forever to find that someday. Oh, man. A friend of mine had it, <laughs> and, which is an important part of my comic uh, upbringing, was that I always had other guys who had comics, and one guy who had a lot. In fact, he was the guy who brought me to the comic store the first time. And when I say guy, you know, he was a kid my age. Um and, yeah, he introduced me to a lot of stuff. I mean, I saw the first Treasuries at his place, and, and uh, he had a lot of the Mego action figures, which oh. was a whole other thing. Legion of Superheroes. What an exciting-looking book that was as I was a little kid in the 70s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Et cetera. Was, and I think one of the things that happened with Shooter, yes, the, the trains ran on time. woo But, but right. there was no longer that sense of it's a, anything can happen. It's a ghost train. And you had a few books. You had Daredevil, Daredevil when Miller was on it. You had the Fantastic Four with Byrne. You had Thor with Simonson. Thor with Simonson. You had uh, Claremont Sex. Write these down. But most of the books were just going through the motions. They one one issue stories. Hero meets villain. Okay. Villain beats hero. Hero figures out a way to win. Hero wins in the end. Maybe a subplot to the next issue. Or, at the other extreme, you had the Denny O'Neill Iron Man story, where Iron Man fell off the wagon. Now, when you did it earlier on, when it was Bob Layton and Dave Michelinie, it was interesting. It was, you know, he started having problems because of it. It was in the background until finally they had a three-part story ending it. It didn't last forever. Mm -hmm. They did make it a part of the book, but it wasn't the focus of the book. Then Denny O'Neill said, well, I'm going to do an alcoholism story. The goddamn thing took three years. Iron Man didn't just become an alcoholic. He became a stumble bum, homeless guy, living in a daughter. I actually enjoyed that. Uh, I almost became an alcoholic from looking at Luke McDonald's that art back the, then. The I became an alcoholic for the fact that the story lasted over 30 years. <laughs> to me, that, became one. that didn't matter to me at the point, because I was like, it just kept going, and uh, it was cool, because, you know, roads took over. Oh, uh, it was the bane of my existence. Start it never ended. And it, no, but when it did wrap <laughs> it's up, it's still it going. It's freaking cool. cool. By the time it wrapped up, I no longer care. Armored up. You had Stain getting all armored up. And yeah, just, yeah, like, and it actually, fight scene. it actually, the art w- had changed, and it was getting, well, I d- I got nothing against Luke McDonald now. I could go back and read that easy, but at the time, I was hating a lot of the art I was seeing in these books. Al Milgram was killing me on about fifteen uh, books. Everything I wanted to read, he drew. You know, Herb <laughs> Trimp was still killing me. Luke McDonald after Leighton and Romita, Romita Junior with Leighton's inks or finishes probably on Iron Man. There was there was oh, just yeah. nothing that, that could was kick-ass stuff. Yeah, and then I think about the the crap 
that was Captain America 300. They had this great storyline going up. It was going to be a big fight with the Red Star. And it wasn't even a double size issue. Everything else Whoa. was a double size issue. I was like, what are they doing? And everything they built up to it didn't happen. <laughs> I remember reading it going, oh, they're building up, and here's this new character who's a Native American, and here's all this stuff. Oh, my gosh, Cap has lost his powers. And then, ah, oh, yeah, fight scene in the end. Yeah, and they talk about it in the book because who's who's doing the book at the time? Which book? J.M.D. Matias, and, and he had gotten everything approved. Schumer decided to punish him, cut the book in half, oh. and rewrote it himself. Really? Yeah, and got rid of not the a good book. No, it wasn't. no. he was going to have the Native American take over as Captain America for a while. Oh, that's a good idea. I wish he. And then Shooter was like, Black. you know, and had approved it all the way through Pro, until the last. Who we're talking Shooter about? Said, nah. Nah, nah, okay. no. I'm not going to let that go. Another interesting thing I, I found in the book is as time went on, and it's, they, they pick on Chris Claremont a lot, he R- became really? like the godfather of the X. You didn't use an X-Men character without interesting, his yeah. authorization and approval. I loved the Marvel Universe, and, and as that kid that I was then, the X-Men never felt like part of the Marvel Universe, and, and I just didn't the enjoy the book or the characters. Chris ran the X-Men. I mean, oh, he had it for, go. what, 20 years? And he did interesting things. I mean, he would t- tap back into things he'd done before, like he'd have uh, Luke Cage, or uh, Power Man, as he was then known and is still known to me, and Iron Fit in the book, Colleen Wing, things like that. Um, but he'd also I, do that was cool. Like he'd never finish. Oh, like, yeah. There was that one issue, yeah. and I, I don't know if... That one was, issue that still isn't it, ended. It was right before... Uh, one fifty, and I don't know if this is because he was thrown off when one forty nine. Him write, rewrite one thirty seven, and I, I've read oh, yeah. both issues yeah. of the original storyline of one thirty seven, the death where, of Phoenix, yeah, where she was just going to be lobotomized, yep. and then I read the actual death issue. Yeah, the death issue in my mind is a lot stronger because they went back and they did change some of the characterizations. And there was a great... Was yeah, that was good stuff. When I say I don't like the X-Men, don't... don't. Well, there was, a <laughs> there point, was stuff that was great. Yeah. There was a point where he had... Okay, Banshee met his daughter, Siren. Yeah. And Spider-Woman was there. And... And you were there. That was the and end you of it. you were there. <laughs> what they had on the next issue. Yeah. They disappeared. And they'd show up in Excalibur later on. And it got to the point where they... But never finished a storyline. And again, you're talking boilerplate. It was almost like, okay, here comes the super tough villain that's going to destroy everything. We just barely defeated him, but <clears throat> he's off in the sunset just in time for another super, super power villain. It's like, oh, what are you going to do when you stop Apocalypse? Put him in jail? Apocalypse. No. Every villain that the X Men fought was crazy powerful. And they had some fun stuff. I mean, when the New Mutants no, came no. around, With all garbage. that was. Incredible because that was like, oh was cool, yeah. They're doing a second X Men book. Same thing like when Peter Parker Spectacular Spider Man came around. Oh my god, a second Spider Man book? These are big things. Yeah, wait a minute, that, wait too. a minute. Spider Man's fighting a guy in a pig costume who talks in CB slang. Yeah, I don't yeah. need to read that. <laughs> but in a champion series that they just canceled. In- in my non-defense, I loved the uh, Razorback issues. That's oh, good God. Work, buddy. Get me, oh. Must have appealed to a kid, you know? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, i got to get a sketch Razorback. Are you listening? No. Oh, <laughs> See, for me with the X-Men, I think the death of Phoenix. And I was at a convention in Chicago, I think, right before it came out. And Shooter talked at the time about was it a how. Was a convention or was it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It was uh, one was of those. Yeah, it was well, it was a creation. It was back when creation did conventions. So it was comics and movies and in a hotel in Chicago. And then to this day, I don't know why my parents sent me there because, you know, they, they should have sent me to a. The, the, <laughs> anyway. Maybe he won't come back, Ma. That could be. I mean, Terry Gilliam was there. I think back on it now, it's like, oh, my God, I met Terry Gilliam. But at the time, it's like, Terry Gilliam doesn't do comics. I met C.C. Beck. He he tried to talk to me, and I froze up. (laughs) But X-Men was outselling everything. And Shooter was talking about how panicked they were at the office because they could not miss the deadline. There were so many orders for this book. But you look after that, before that, it tied in with the Marvel Universe a lot. 
I mean, he wrapped up plot lines for Kazar, for Christ's and sake. And it looked spectacular. It was, it was a magnificent looking. After, it was like, okay, they're off on their own world. Marvel team up where, like, uh, I think it was the Living Goliath was. Yeah, Living Monolith. Beast, Closer to the microphone. Beast took off. Yeah. And he shows up in the X Men comics and. Oh, that yeah. was Claremont working his was, stuff yeah, together, yeah. It was crazy crossover, and, you know, you get those little word balloons. Where's the beast going? Follow this in. X-Men. Ah, oh, I it. sure will. It was just fun stuff. Then it just it kind of went off the rail. There were, every so often it'd be, there would be glimpses of fun, like when they all went to space and Kitty Pride dressed up like Dark Phoenix, and you, you, there's a one. Oh, thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah. the cover and you're like, oh my god, Dark Phoenix is back. Something goofy's and going on here, yeah. Wait a minute, she's drawn kind of weird. And you realize, <laughs> no, she's drawn like Kitty. Like... Yeah. But it just, it just, they talk about how it just goes. And and by that point, Cockrum, Cockrum was at his most uninspired drawing, too. I mean, I, that was a, a letdown, also. The last thing I want to talk about. Made a about boring book, boring her. Make a, a sad More boring her. Into the Marvel future. Did you guys handbook of the Marvel Universe? God, yes, I loved that. Yes, I, I loved it. Out, I was, uh, I yeah, never bleeded. Corey doesn't for like it. it. Yeah. You no, didn't like I liked, it. I did like, like it. Comics. Did we lose it? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, no, that's all right then. All right, well, I did right. like. I, I had a. I remember at the time going, "Wow, this is uh, this is uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons monster manual stuff," and as I don't think I don't know if they announced it before it was done or right after, but oh, guess what? We've got a Marvel superhero role playing game. Ooh, I love so, I love the pinup art. I uh, I pick up a little bit of information about the characters, oh, yeah, and that, and which became a lot of information by the time it was done. That the first issue started out with just Boy, brief synopsises. Like, issue this for that, you know? Ooh, and then of course the high point of the. Higher X Men run. Excuse me while I get to the page here. X Men 164. Carol Daverns became binary. binary. Dum dum dum. Now, hopefully she does that in that Captain Marvel movie that's coming out. There's a big notice here from when Marvel went. I don't, I don't know. Was it was it Candace Industry or is this when? Uh, yeah, this was before Perlman bought Marvel. But they started really to go oh boy. more corporate, and this yes. was, this kind of came about I think after Shooter was. They were getting very corporate while Shooter like was, was there. Deposed. Yeah, I remember I was working was, at Shooter at the time when Shooter was booted. Shinders. And they just I mean well the last I think the last thing that Shooter did was a uh, new universe. Oh yeah, yeah. That was the last big thing he was involved with. It was 87, uh, 88 uh, when he got I moved. pretty much like it. But New Universe was 86. And that was the, that was because of the New Universe that he got booted? There were a lot of things. Well. The, the biggest thing that I heard at the time going to sales conferences was that, well, you know, New World Pictures is buying us, and he's pretty unstable. And we wanted somebody who could handle things a little easier. And Tom DeFalco had been there forever. He His books were on time. Everybody liked him. He'd worked at Archie in an editorial capacity before he came to Marvel. So it's like, okay, we're going to put him in charge. And he pretty much at that point let the marketing department have say. The yep, the young, hip, fun-loving guys who run New World Dig Marvel Comics as much as you do. This is Stan pushing it. That's why they bought us. They want to make some real dynamite movies and TV show based on your favorite characters. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to snow you. So I'll mention two of their latest smashes. The movie Soul Man and the TV series Sledgehammer. <laughs> and then, of course, one of the big guys who uh, uh, summons the vice president of marketing. I think the guy who says it, his name's Remy. Hey, we just bought Superman. And the vice president president was perplexed. Warner Brothers selling DC Comics? No, 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 we bought Marvel. Oh, no, Bob, we bought Spider-Man. Holy shit, we gotta stop this! Canon has a Spider-Man movie! 
<laughs> so, <laughs> this, uh, when Shooter was l- let go or fired or whatever, is this when we started to see more of the editor-driven stuff? Yeah. No. Under Shooter, things were very editorially driven because if you were an editor at Marvel, you know, Tom DeFalco was an editor at Marvel. To supplement his income, he had two or three books. Denny O'Meal, editor at Marvel, supplement his income, he had two or three books. Ann Nascenti, editor at Marvel, two or three books. Louise Simonson, editor at Marvel, had two or three books. That's how they would bump your income. And in a lot of ways, I think that's why you had such editorial sameness through the 80s, because everybody was editing each other's books, and then Shooter would tell you what you could and couldn't do. And then you had the great stuff like... House 2, Second Story. Oh, yes. The adaptation of a movie that... I loved I loved crappy New World and canon films at the time. Mm-hmm. You couldn't get me to that one. You couldn't pay me to go watch that movie. William Catt from uh, Greatest American Hero. His jump into film there, I've Joe. got that yeah. sitting at home on my need to watch. Let's... I'm to oh, you don't out. need to watch it. You <laughs> need to watch. <laughs> oh, you don't need to watch it. Why Hellboy? Marvel? Hellboy? That's a good one. <laughs> Let's see. New World got in trouble. Uh, and they went bankrupt. And Ron Perlman, the Revlon chairman, not the uh, guy who does Beauty and the Beast and Hellboy. Yeah, that guy. He set up a shell co- corporation and and bought Marvel. Shell game. And, and now, at that point, I was working in comics. Mm-hmm. And I, I still remember I was working at Schindler's when Marvel went public. And I remember at the time, oh, got to buy shares of Marvel. Marvel knows how many, knows their profit before they even go to press. And this was when you had... Um, Spider-Man number one come out, sell a couple million copies. And X-Force number one come out, sell a couple million copies. X-Men number one came out, sold nine million copies. And it was, oh, man. And I was at Schinder's, and people were buying, you know, the, the number of people who were coming in to buy comics was growing. But you also still had the people who would buy one to read and one to put away. Or one to read and five to put away. Or I yeah. got the shiny, the shiny copy of Silver Sable number one. I will put away a dozen of those. Because I think this is when we started to see they, they canceled Epic. Uh, a lot of the creators were let loose. Even Chris Claremont, eventually they uh, they cut him loose. And we started to see more marketing come down. And they would be like, you know what? We're going to have a couple. Let's let's get some some great titles. Big Gun, Silver Sable, Nomad, Punisher <laughs> Warzone. Hey, is you know if your books needs help, <clears throat> let's get you. Not, well, put Ghost Rider or Punisher in it. Ooh, fact, Terror Inc. Let's Full do Killer some Terror covers. We got the the, the anniversary Spider Man. Let's do some three D Spider Man covers. Ooh, individually bagged with yeah, a different yeah. card. Gold. No, no. See, and that was the thing. At the same time this happened, it's the same time the Image Boys started to show up. You had Liefeld suddenly pop up on, on New Mutants. Mm-hmm. Jim Lee, he'd been he'd been doing stuff. He, he did like Alpha the, Flight. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, <laughs> then he was given X Men. McFarlane, well, McFarlane, what he did Infinity, Infinity Inc for DC. Yeah, did a couple stories. Coyote worked on their Invasion storyline. Yep, and then he was well, doing Hulk. amazing. He Spider-Man. did the he did the Hulk. Yeah, Valentine. You're forgetting the Hulk. I, the Hulk's well, where he oh, became Hulk, a star. Course, yeah. yeah, I love that. And see, that was I, exciting. As these guys showed up, yeah, this was fun stuff. I mean, I I was reading New Mutants, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, next issue, the coming of Cable, and I was like, whoa. Wow, finally going to get and Cable. I know Liefeld gets a lot of grief for his heart, but man, I was blown away. This was so dynamically different. It was just a blast. Yeah, yeah. It, he seemed to be putting more work into it. Then. I had some of the new 98 slides around. <laughs> Holy crap. You see the price on them? No, bastards? what are we talking like about? 500 bucks? Holy crap. And the Daredevil number one? I remember putting it right back on the shelf at the oh, source. Not the no, shelf, no. but in that little yeah, slot that yeah, they had them in. Yeah. Oh, well, you bent it first. I yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. no, I didn't have to. But it came that way. Yeah. So, yeah. The that was worth five bucks. started to come up. And I think this is where... 
and we've talked about it in the past where we saw more of editor controlling what was going on. I mean, and marketing would come down and say, you know what? We get this spider clone saga. Let's keep it going. Oh, yes. And Thank goodness. They pissed off Dan Jurgens because he was told, yeah, I'm going to finish this up. No, no, we're going to keep it going I'll for keep, a little bit. Keep, it's great. Great stuff. It's the greatest thing ever. And this what was, if Spider-Man's well, clone had lived? This was when Gruber <laughs> and I not only were, but we were buying multiple copies of this shit, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. anytime time oh, okay, let's see. These issues are okay, but the next one's got a Oh, Web of Spidey 100, green foil. Oh, oh, that's, oh that's, that's spider armor. Yeah. Well, that's a Peter Parker issue that had Peter some Parker. type of prism cover on it, and I don't know what issue it was, but I was up in northern Minnesota. And Let's the go issue to prism. Was like, like three, four bucks, <laughs> and I knew they were selling for 10 bucks when you went to Comic Cons. I bought five off this guy's newsstand, and you'd have thought he was like, duh. <laughs> Wow. That's like 25 bucks in comics. We've never sold that much. Sold out, Ma. Uh, order more of them. just bringing this. Well, it was newsstand. They just get it and sell it, you know, and return it. But it was just crazy times because you I don't remember that cover. Stuff. You could go to one of the, the monthly shows because Greenberg had a show. You know, the MCBA had their two shows. Uh, Gruber and I, we were going... Well, Wisconsin to Dells, we go to Duluth, yeah. Chicago, down to Kansas City. Yeah. I mean, we kept thinking we'd go farther and farther. I mean, I bought a, a used... Brazil? Not no. that far. No. No, we got D- 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 He come later. Oh, thank you. But, yeah, we had, we bought a, I bought a Ford Ranger. We spent That's some a little money pickup truck. our, our uh, money and put some, like, heavy-duty shocks on it. Because the first time we loaded uh, up for a gun, <laughs> yeah, it was, like, yeah. two inches. <laughs> Yeah, but Drew weighed about 350 back then. Yeah, well, that was at the front end. So we were the first, we were the first low rider, get it? Doom, 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 doom. Joe Ryder. But it was crazy because you knew. <laughs> and they talk about it in, in the Marvel Comics Unsold Stories how issue 50 had a foil cover and the sales went crazy. And then the in between issues were like, go down again. Uh, how on earth that worked is beyond me. Well, I'm telling you, it was guys like me and Drew. As are most things. Let's Buy ten copies of this one because it's got a, a gold in the cover. Gold shiny uh, cover, see, shiny not, Marvel com. And Marvel wasn't the only one doing that. Oh, no, they weren't. There was a Tyvek indestructible cover over at who? Who had that? Somebody had that. Oh, that, that was. Was, um, was it continuity? Innovation. Nope, it was innovation. Innovation. For the um, gosh, Mac Bolin the Executioner yes. series. Ooh. Is that when we had the shop? Was Bulletproof. And that's when Dave proved it wasn't. Indestructible. Not indestructible, yeah. He yeah. worked about a week out in that before it took. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this was kind of the beginning of the end because the editorial group was like, you know what? If one Spider Man comic sells, let's do another one. Yeah, let's do 14 of them. And they f- Fantastic Force! Oh. I am shaking my head. But this oh, led to... Son, that's the man who ruined the Fantastic Four. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, though. The guy who wrote Fantastic Force, Tom Brevoort, who's still an editor at Marvel, uh, longest-running editor yeah, at Marvel, will has said if you bring copies to him, he will personally apologize to I you. I don't know how... I don't even know how... <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying, but... Um, comics were ugly at that point, too. They were all under. The, were they under the influence of Image in those Fantastic yes, Four days? Yes. They, not yet. You had all these people who wanted to. Well, by ninety two, ninety three, ninety four, everybody was looking at Liefeld's art mm-hmm. and Eric Larson's art mm-hmm. and and that, and going, "Well, that must be what the kids like," because that's when Herb Trimpey started to. Oh, like remember Robert. that? You want the books to look like this? I'll show you the books that look like. Oh, they were hideous. And I, I didn't know he could I, get worse. I, I talked with Herb Trimpey when he was at one of our conventions, and I was very kind about it. He was not told by Marvel to do that. He did it on yeah, his I own. I seem to remember reading that somewhere. He said that, oh, this is what well, the I'm kids not getting like. as much work as I used to. This is what the kids like. When I broke into comics, kids liked um, Kirby, so I drew like Kirby. There you go. Then on G.I. Joe, people liked the John Buscema, so I drew like John Buscema. Now they like Liefeld, so I'll draw like Liefeld. Holy cow. So that's why when he started doing his, oh, Marvel kicked me out because I'm old. It's no, Marvel kicked you out because the art you were turning in was terrible. I remember the great idea. Let's uh, let's uh, 
uh, do uh, uh, Spider-Man, Punisher, Doctor Doom. I'll put him in the year 2099. Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 2099 books. Hey, remember, remember. Did you read the 2099 See, book? Wolverine, Spider-Man, and the Punisher, and put him in Secret Defenders. Ooh, Secret Defenders, no. Well, that was... That's a, what's a secret? I never... This, too, was when... That appeared to be a messy time to me in comics, whereas in the 70s, I didn't have a clue it was messy. Oh. I just believed that each issue... I didn't, didn't matter if it was a different writer-artist team. That's just the way I accepted it. I, I, I well, no different. when you're younger, it's, well, that's the way it is. Yep. And then when you get older and you know what's going on behind the scenes, you're like, oh, this guy just screwed it up. <laughs> What a mess. They talk about it what in, an asshole. Comics again told stories that they were doing royalties. And so everybody was like, oh, let's get into a crossover. Let's get the Punisher yeah, in my yeah, book. Yeah. Hot know, character, hot give character. Give him a bump or, you know, yeah, I'll put a nice shiny cover so that uh, dumb boys in Minnesota buy it. Vengeance. Ah, uh, vengeance. So there was there was a reason to want to do this. Uh, let's figure out how to uh, uh, shoehorn in Wolverine or something. But then they also, Midnight at Sun. the same time, Oh, uh, Spider Man number song. one with McFarlane. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Only to be exceeded by X Force. Yeah. With that was the poly bag with the card in every single. One. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah, and you had to buy like six of them to get all the cards or something. And then and then Jim Lee with his okay same book. Yep. Different cover every week. Yep. And then one book with the very very end. That has all the covers. All the covers. A fold out all the covers. super fold out, which was pretty cool. And. They talk about how people would go, let's see, who's quoting this here? Probably Herb Trimp. Trimpy. Uh, Trimpy. See. Blah, 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 blah. Hercules? Blah, 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 blah. It was collecting comics for like a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Uh, reporter, this Sad. is from reporter Douglas Cass, who started reporting it in Barron's. I saw boxes upon boxes filled with unsold copies of the highly promoted premier issue of X-Men and X-Force, titles that were introduced nearly six months. Months ago. It wasn't my fault because I bought about 10 of them. Oh, I can't even think of what the hell Gruber and I bought. <laughs> All I remember is when we finally did have Hot Comics, we found an unopened box of the gatefold cover of X Men number one. We never got to oh it and goodness. obviously forgot about yep. it. Pat and I opened it up and put it out at cover price. It was just and part of the comic thrown in the back there were room. What, 50 comics in a box like that, or maybe 100? You got me. We, we thousand? that's how we sold them. We take them to cons. Hey, how much? Four bucks. Yeah, yeah, really? yeah. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh buy wall. <laughs> but that's what, oh, sucker. That's what I think drove Marvel, and it drove marketing insane, and it drove the editors insane. Where are these and profits when you sell those kind of? I mean, whether you sell fifty thousand copies of a book or a million copies of the book, there's a different profit <laughs> involved. Did, did, did nobody invest this money wisely and? Sit on it? No. Oh, my God. Yeah, probably not. Well, remember, Liefeld bought his parents a house with the check from X-Force number one. He bought them a half-million-dollar house. People were spending money stupid. And Jeez. if you remember at the time, I was saying these companies need to plow the money back in advertising. And instead, they were, you know, Marvel was publicly held, so they were putting it out as stock dividends. But... They were actually pulling back on advertising. They were less and less money for the co-op ads, less and less money for ads in newspapers. Well, nope, uh, people aren't using them. Really? Because I'm seeing lots of ads on TV. Well, uh, you, well we, we want to spend the money in other ways. The one I remember most, Malibu. Okay. Hey, we bought a whole bunch of ads. Oh. And then I read an article about it, and they bought ads on bus stops in, like, the worst neighborhoods in town, <laughs> you have in, my, in Chicago and stuff, because they were cheapest. Jump on now. Don't you have that huge window size? Uh, yes, line? yes, it, it I do. Unrolled, and you could actually see it from the street, like something. It oh, was double sided. Yeah. Yep. So the light would go through it. In June 1992, and this is where I want to probably leave off. I guess is when Martin Goodman died, and he had retired to Florida, passed away at 82. And this is when the comic industry kind of took a big turn. I don't. This is when the Image Boys bolted. Uh, the Marvel yeah. stock started faltering. Uh, you know, before we talk about 92, though, what was – we talked a little bit about New Mutants. What was your reaction to, to uh, Marlon's Spider-Man? Either what he did in Amazing or when you heard, okay, he's 
from Amazing Spider-Man. Yeah, that's Spider-Man. a good that's a good point. Spider-Man. That's a good point because I was enjoying his Amazing Spider-Man, but by the time uh, the individual, the self-titled, what, what do we call it, sing, it was just adjectiveless. Man, uh, book came out. I remember. Yeah, them calling adjective it with adjective. Spider-Man was a little seemed like a little overkill. And uh, I think the uh, the uh, editor, what was his name, Jim Salkrup. Yeah, Salkrup. I, yeah. Basically told McFarlane, Salakrup. do whatever you want. And he, he did. And McFarlane loved it. He just said, he did, yeah. Whatever. The final straw for oh, the kids are going to love this. He did that crossover with X Force, and he was given grief because he was drawing a thing where Shatterstar drove the sword and to Juggernaut's eye. <laughs> really? And I was like, ah! awesome. <laughs> I mean, that's what Juggernaut said, too. <laughs> yeah, but that, you got to remember, that was still, they were still going under the comics code. Whether well, he had to change it. Because of the comic code. Yeah, originally yeah, he was going to hit him in the uh, store. And that, and it, with McFarlane, you can never tell if it's you know retroactive continuity. But he was like, "Oh, that was enough. I'm out of here." And he actually was out of comics, I believe, in my opinion, a year before the whole image thing popped up. Yep. Yep. Really. What? Yep. He dropped out of comics. Now, one of the things he was so far ahead on Spider-Man stuff was still coming out. But he had said, I'm done with comics, I'm not going to work in them anymore. And he'd made so much money on Spider-Man, he didn't have to work. I remember when Image was announced, I was working at Schinders, I was near the end of my time at Schinders. And I turned in my orders, and they actually called and went, why did you put down you want so many copies of Youngblood? And I said, well, it's Rob Liefeld, the last number one he put out in my shop sold 500 copies. <laughs> I think it's smart to get at least half that. And they were, nope, once a creator goes from Marvel to an indie, mm-hmm. nobody cares anymore. <laughs> Nobody's buying Neil Adams stuff. <laughs> yeah, just ask that and, variant hunters nowadays. And then I have I had left Shinders, because a, a whole bunch of reasons, but I left Shinders. But I remember hearing that for at least the first six months, they had under-ordered on all of the image stuff, and they were selling out like within the first hour. The shop I used to run, I remember they got 20 copies of Youngblood. Mm-hmm. I'd said 350, we'd sold 500 X Force. They got 20 copies. <laughs> and that's why all the other shops were able to just pound shinders into the dirt for six months. Do you remember? When we went, we went to the image tent. That yeah, year, ninety-two. Yep. I think it was the second con. It was about Fourth of July, in ninety-two. I remember we all get we all got in line, you know, to go into the image tent. Yeah, yeah. And image had set up. Uh, this was in Chicago, the Chicago Comic Convention. And image had set up. Image was a new springing up thing, and it had set up and a big, big Chicago, tent. Chicago was just as big as San Diego. And they had just been bought by Wizard, but they, Wizard hadn't put their stamp on it yet. And it was in a hotel. For the last time yeah. before it went to a convention center, the Rosemont Convention Center. I remember we were in line doing the tent, and I, I, you were there. I think Nick Ives, I don't mm-hmm. know, Dave, mm-hmm. and uh, Groover, Jess. Mm-hmm. And as we were walking into the tent, this guy was, hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for your support. Like, Who was that? That was Todd McFarlane. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Wow, that was cool. Todd was very enthusiastic and very hands-on, and, and he was giving a good speech about how they're not going to drop the ball and stuff. I thought it was, uh, I, I was into oh, yeah. that, too. We were getting in on the ground floor. And then as we are sitting there, the other image guys would come walking in. And you stood up, faced the back of the tent, and went, Hi, Rob! Hi, Rob! <laughs> Hi, Rob! Hi, Rob! Hi, Rob! Hi, Rob! Hi, Rob! Matter of fact, I think you left before the I was we doing, could actually get up to the image. Guys. I was doing my Bruiser Brody impression is <laughs> what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Rob! Uh, Hi, Rob. Our scrub, Dave. Hush! He, did, did you go down to the Hush. 24 hour uh, Young Blood signing? I don't remember Which if I did. did. I, like about 4 30. I probably did go down there five times, I but I don't Dave remember. Went down, he got himself to Young Blood. Mm-hmm. You guys had a camera going. I would mm-hmm. love to get this film if it's around. Okay. And you were filming it. Dave's like, here's what I think of Young Blood. Yeah. He rips it in half. Yeah. And, and throws threw it, it out the, the 
window <laughs> of the hotel where the it lands on the awning down, down below. Oh, yeah, one lands on an awning, the other piece lands on the ground. <laughs> Some kid finds it. Oh, <laughs> it's half a young blood. <laughs> he's looking for the other half. It's on the ceiling. It's on a ledge like that, uh, two that, stories above him. That was the product of how Dave was going to go down and rip it <laughs> right in front of Rob we well, after like, Rob signed it, we but he bailed. Like, he admittedly chickened out. Why didn't you just somebody pay you 20 bucks for it? <laughs> oh. You chickened out. I would have chickened out, too. That's that's very impolite. And then, of course, by September 92, Gruber and I committed to buy Hot Comics St. Paul. Ooh. And the rest, you can go to uh, to uh, Crazy Stories and Comics podcast number one and just follow along because we <laughs> <everybody. laughs> Yeah, just get caught up. There's only like uh, 500 hours worth of uh, podcasts you'll, in there. You'll get the About the that. Time. One question, Corey, because you're probably the most uh, knowledgeable about Jack Kirby. Not about. He really was bitching up a storm on some of the quotes here at the end of this year book. <laughs> yeah. It sound, I don't know if he was just... I, I mean, I know he was bitter, but I mean, he was like... I created everything. He didn't do nothing. Stan didn't write nothing. Blah, 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 blah. And it just went on and on and on. And If you look at Jack's work, you can even see this bitterness creep into that when he had his fight over the original art with Marvel. Now, he and Stan have a complicated history. Very true. I'll say. Back um, when he was doing... When Joe Simon was editor-in-chief at Marvel, and they were doing Captain America, part of the agreement was that they got royalties. And Stan, uh, Joe and Jack also were kind of doing some moonlighting, even though they had an exclusive contract. So they were not, you know, they weren't choir boys. They were moonlighting and doing work for, for DC. But then they thought... That um, Martin Goodman was screwing them on royalties, and that's why they were, you know, shipping ideas and stuff to other companies. Martin Goodman found out that they were working at DC, fired them. That's why Captain America 10, their last issue, Captain America 11, they weren't involved in. Jack believes Stan is the one who ratted him out. And so they never when, worked together again after that. Yeah. Well, and then when Jack had no place else to go, and he went to Marvel, he'll tell this story about how he walked into Marvel, and Stan was sitting there at, at, in a chair crying because the movers were coming and taking out the furniture. And, oh, boo-hoo, fan. And he told Stan, no, 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 don't take out the furniture. I can save the company. No one else has a memory of this. <laughs> Nobody else. Fin, now, fan, boom. when Kirby worked at Marvel, it was because there was no place else to work other than Carlton. And he didn't want to work at Carlton because Carlton was controlled by the mob. But by the 60s, sales started jumping up and they were getting merchandising stuff. You look in those comics in 65, you have Thor pillows and Captain America shirts and, and all this. And Jack was, you know, he'd worked for Goodman in the... In the 40s, and it's the, the artist got a cut. They're using my art. I should get a cut. And Goodman said, okay, in your next contract, we'll figure it out. Well, um, Ditko tried to get a contract. He was promised the same thing, and the contract didn't come, 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 and Ditko said, fuck you guys, I'm out of here. With Jack, Joe Simon put in a copyright claim on Captain America which he legally could do. We created Captain America this many years ago. The copyright is now up for renewal. I created this character independent of Marvel. I want my character back. Goodman promised Kirby that if he would testify for Marvel, he would um, get a staff position and he would get royalties and he would get a piece of the merchandising and blah, 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 blah. So Jack testified that, nope, we created Captain America on assignment for Marvel. Copyright claim was thrown out of court. Came time to negotiate the contract. Goodman said, uh, yeah, I'm not really thinking about negotiating a contract. We're just going to keep working under, under what we have. Well, the contract's up. We need a new one. Now, we're just going to keep working under that same agreement. 
which you can also point to, that was when Jack stopped creating new characters, when Jack wanted to write his own stuff. So he was working at Marvel, really pissed. He blamed Stan. He said that Stan is the one who's screwing me over. So when DC, he moved out to L.A., Carmine Infantino flew out there, said, hey, Jack, you know, we'll give you this, we'll give you this, here's your page rate, blah, blah, blah. That's why when Jack left, he didn't give any notice to Marvel. He just called him on a Friday and said, the book that I just sent is the last one I'm doing, goodbye. Kirby is coming. Yep. Now, I found it interesting in the book, they talked about, you know, we know Kirby went over to DC. Oh, forever people. But Kirby had started a Ragnarok story in Thor. And you tell me if it's true or not. The the Marvel Comics book we've been talking about claims that these were the new gods that were going to replace Thor and the other old gods. And since he was not allowed to do it with Marvel, he did it. He he started this with DC. Damn right. Which could have been amazing. Dark side at Marvel. I, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's really hard to say. Jack says Victory. that he was creating the new gods all on their own. That he was creating these characters because he didn't want to give, give any more characters to Marvel. He'd given enough characters to Marvel because they weren't going to give him royalties, because they weren't going to give him a cut, because they were using his work on TV. you got to remember that Marvel cartoons, they were literally cutting out pages of the comic and turning them into cartoons. They were using his art for TV and told that, nope, you get your page rate and that's it. So he was creating all these characters. We'll never know if maybe they would have come to an agreement Jack would have said, oh, okay, now I'll do these books at Marvel. Or if it was, no, I'm just going to create these characters because I want to create characters and when I go to a new company, I'll use them there. And there was something very symbolic at the beginning of the New Gods, because it was, Ragnarok happened. The old gods are dead. Then come the New Gods. But I don't... I think with Martin Goodman, he never would have given Jack what he wanted. Yeah. Jack was offered John Romita's job before John Romita took it. Jack was offered, because Stan was overwhelmed, Stan wanted to no longer be art director. They offered it to Jack. Jack wanted to keep drawing comics. So they went to John Romita Jr., who jumped on it. And if you look at the time, Romita was doing Spider-Man. Ah, that's kind of when Gil Kane took over Spider-Man. And Romita wasn't doing as much. And he would do, like, character designs and first issues and stuff. But he was the art director. He designed the covers. He's the one who uh, had Ramita's Raiders, who were the guys in the office who did all the art corrections and stuff. So we could speculate all we want. As long as Martin Goodman was in charge of Marvel, Jack Kirby was going to leave. Jesus, you ask Corey what time it is? He tells you how to build a watch. (laughs) I I warn people, you get me talking about Kirby. I give you one quote that Lee talked about. He says in 93, he had a chance meeting at San Diego. Jack said something strange to me. He called me over and said, and again, I felt Jack wasn't fully with it, you know. He said to me, you have nothing to reproach yourself about, Stan. And it was such kind of a strange thing for him to say. I was glad to hear it, but I didn't expect it. And that was about it. People came over, interrupted, and he went away. And, and of course, the Jack main reason for that in mm. Jack had done an interview with the Comics Journal where he just ripped Stan mercilessly. Stan, you know, that was where you that's where all the quotes of Stan never did anything. Stan was you know, Stan was marketing, Stan never wrote a damn thing in his life, blah blah blah. That was in the middle of that art fight. And Jack and Roz were just furious that They felt they were being screwed over. Everybody else was getting their original art back, even if they didn't want it, like Steve Ditko. But with Jack, it was, okay, everybody else gets a little agreement to sign. You get this four-page thing that in it says you can never sell the art. Marvel can come and take the art from your house at any time. No. Sell it. Yeah. 
Put it on eBay, which hadn't been invented for another decade. Co- color it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Big thing. Color, color crayons. Yeah, if, if you read that journal interview with Kirby, it's so not like the Jack that everybody knew. But then if you go and you read The New Gods, that last story of The New Gods, remember, I don't know if you guys were as big into The New Gods as I was. I wasn't. You? But Metron had a little boy who traveled with him. And that little boy was kind of the youthful sense of wonder. Well, when Jack yeah. came back, that Jack little boy day, had, Jack had came turned back, evil. He thought he was a goner, but when Jack came back, he just wouldn't stay away. That little boy had grown to be evil and cynical and dark and a follower of dark side. And that was Jack kind of saying to the reader, look, that youthful sense of wonder, that was great, but Have it's stupid. It's stupid. You're going to get your heart broke. And there are a lot of people who say that when they would talk to Jack about comics after like 96, I'm sorry, after like 86, 87, he used to be very encouraging, but he would say stuff like, don't get into comics. Comics will break your heart, kid. I'm sorry, were you saying something? Nah, 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 nah. Cool. So Kirby then. Marvel Comics: The Untold Story by Sean Howe. I you know who hasn't read that book, Joe? I give it a thumbs up. Who? These guys. I love. No. Oh. These guys. <laughs> our sponsors. That's right. Here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network, we have ads, and our first sponsor is me. That's right, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. I have my first book out with Dangerous Dan Moore. It's the first hundred strips of our online web strip, Worldwide News, the story of the lowest-rated cable news network. And you can get yourself a copy with commentary, with all sorts of extras, with uh, signatures and everything. Just email Dan over at lordshadowflame at gmail.com. Our top sponsor who's been with us since day one is dreamhost dreamhost.com you need yourself a website and dreamhost.com is the number one web host in the whole known universe just head over to dreamhost.com put in the code crazy k-r-a-y-z get twenty dollars off your first year how can you beat that our other sponsor is graze g-r-a-z-e dot com healthy snacks for a healthy lifestyle just head over to Gray's, put in the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-P. Your first and fifth box are free. You can get them weekly. You can get them bi-weekly. You can get them monthly. You just order a whole bunch of them. It's great stuff to keep you away from the vending machine at work. Now, if you would like to leave a comment for any of the podcasts that we do, we'd love those. Go ahead and email us at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com or you can call 952-856-0519. Operators are standing by. Okay, it's just a place that will record your calls, but we'll play them on the air. We'll answer your questions. We love getting feedback. Tell us what you think. Ask a question. Suggest a topic. Be a guest. Send us your stuff. Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. If you would like to advertise on any of the Solitaire Rose radio shows, you can. Just email us at Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. Subject advertising. Thanks. I was going to say Butch, but here, Butch, you can read my copy. Oh, thank you. I need that bookmark. Can't read. Sorry. By the, the other way, book I'm on to read. eBay. Crazy. K R A Y Z. Comics. Yeah. Comics. Something for everyone. Now, I'm going to say this is Corey's favorite part of the show. And really? I'm going to limit it. We're at we, we talked pretty much about Marvel from our first comic to the death 1992. Of yeah, the death of Superman. What are you freaking on about that particular time period of Marvel? And I'll, I'll start as I want to do. I am freaking that of all these comics we talked about, and even ones previous that I sold them, I used to have Amazing Spider-Man 29. I've had five copies of Hulk 181. I had Amazing Spider-Man 300. I had New Mutants 98. Oh, man, I just, I, I got the selling bug. And I I shudder to think what my comic collection look, look, look like had I actually not sold shit and just kept it. And (coughs) 
You see, I'm choking up. Yeah. Part Me of what too. I'm doing now oh. is even like, you know, I talked about Burns Fantastic Four run. I don't have <laughs> Miller's Daredevil run. I need to get that because you I want to read it. Shot. Um, you know, I will read Secret Wars occasionally, nostalgically, and I have yeah. it, but yeah. I don't have John Burns' Alpha Flight. Uh. Uh, well, guess what, Joe? They're putting out an omnibus of it. Pink Pearl. I can actually pick it up. Unless I can dig them out of the quarter box for less. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of things that I had. And then I, even now I go back and it's just amazing considering I started in 77, yet I was able to buy back issues fairly cheap. I got almost the entire X-Men run. Mm-hmm. Uh, one year, Gruber, my ma, gave Pat a call and asked what would be a good book for a Christmas item. Yeah. Uncanny X-Men number 94. <laughs> Wow! Very cool. Yeah, sold wow. it of course, but you know, I yeah, right, he yeah. did it. He so tried. That's kind of what I'm freaking out. In fact, you know, we and I love reading. Butch and I were talking before the podcast. I love reading Alter Ego. I love reading Back Issue because it reignites my sense of wonderment about those times, and Something it like, informs us about those times oh, yeah. of what we didn't have what a clue of. On? Yeah. And this book, if you haven't read it, again, Marvel Comics: The Untold Story. It was fun and. Part of what I told Corey, I said, you know, I want to talk about these comics because as I'm reading the book, I'm stopping and thinking, oh, yeah, I remember pre-ordering X-Men number one, Jim Lee, and going insane, you know. Yeah, Cooper yeah. I bought 100 copies. I bought 25 copies, and we sold them at cons, yada, yada. Well, we were young, and we were in forward motion, so it was all very exciting. It was, yeah. it was a – I don't think it mattered what was happening. We were all real excited about it. We were coming together as a bigger and bigger group, getting to know each other better, and it, the enthusiasm was contagious. Oh, yeah. oh it was ma- I mean, we we'd go down to Chicago with like ten guys, you know, and just <laughs> and yeah, over. and just rampage through this place. And we'd be, you know, even things like I'd be sitting. I think I was working Sears at the time. And, oh, there's a new Marvel comic actor, <laughs> and he's gay. I'm gay. And so I call. Is this a Sears tower? Let me in. And the I Sears Tower. Brian, I say, hey, there's a lot of lot of news about this. What was it? Alpha Flight 105. No, Alpha Flight something. And uh, give me a copy. You know, it was just fun. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some Every there was big enthusiasm for everything. The uh, the like the comics buyer's guide was a good source of getting us excited about stuff. There was no internet yet. You know, it was a different. Vibe, but this was fun, but it, that even took some of it away. It was, I mean, the last comic I ever found on newsstand that shocked me was Rom Number One. Jeez, a Marvel comic. Yeah, never heard of. Didn't know it. what was going on. Better pick it up. Just ah, man. the Marvel logo. I swear, I saw it advertised, so I knew it was coming. Uh, you know, in the other by books. Issue three, it was advertised. I ain't read ads. What? I ain't not read no ads. What about this era? Freaks you out, or that you'd be freaking out. It, it was uh, it was a freight train from the time I discovered comics up to the time where we jumped off there and beyond. And I was freaking about everything. I was recently in a, on the contrary, I was recently in a conversation with a friend of mine where I said, I wonder, you know, if you now that I'm getting a little. I'm getting, well, only a little older, and I have a little more discerning taste. I say, I wonder what of those comic books, and we, we really alluded to this and talked about it here today, that that we were reading and we were getting and we were enthusiastic about, and oh, just were getting savage. jammed down our throats. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're really, really that good. The book you know? about it was just so they could keep the, the uh, rights. Yeah, the copyrights. Yeah. yeah, I'm reading Marvel Team Up. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Hey, Marvel 2 and 1, Thing in the Scarecrow. Oh. You know? Who's he? We'll find out. But I was enthusiastic about uh, I, it. Was just a forward momentum thing with me, you know. Every every book that came out was exciting. Every trip to the comic store was a thrill. Every uh, convention, which I I went to one before, but I really started going to in '83 when John had his conventions, which are small by comparison. In '84, you and Pat were set up at that yeah. at his convention. Um, everything that happened just built on the foundation of what I loved about this as I as I got to um, know more guys who were into it you get to meet the creators the whole thing was I don't have the word for it but it was really something did you ever find yourself something. trying to hunt down issues because of the little time 
See X Men number fifty two. Yeah, I did, I did, and I'd also, as I got older, I'd hit the quarter boxes and just buy everything oh, I didn't John, have. That quarter sale that one year. That dime oh, sale. God, yeah. Yeah. And, oh, I wish I had those books. I, I came home with a grocery out. bag full of two. comics. I yeah, two grocery out. bags full of comics. Yeah. Oh, twenty bucks, ten dollars, or ten. Oh, you could book. just buy anything you wanted. Captain Marvel. I mean, that's where I found all these seventy books for a dime, and now, I yeah, they're only about. Plenty of pieces. Oh, God. No Corey, kidding. what's got you freaking on this particular era we've been talking about? Yeah, era. Era. Decades. My big problem with the era was when stories would start and then not finish. Omega, the unknown will be finished Ooh. in the Defenders. Leave it to Corey to hate comics. Yeah, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is freaking. <laughs> okay, we'll you know, you the whole man wolf thing. Oh, we got this big man wolf story. It's going to be a cosmic story. And awesome. <laughs> Oh, Kill Raven. No? Oh. Oh, we got this graphic novel. It's oh, going to lead into right, where eventually Kill Raven's going to go to Mars and fight the Martians. We... And... No. Oh. Oh, no. To be Hulk in nude. Hey, I can't wait. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the Black Panther's fighting the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, it's going to be finished in a. No, no, it's not. John Burns, The Last Galactus Story. The Last Galactus can't Story? Wait. Oh, boy. How's that end? Oh. <laughs> Never last. They're killing off Superman? Wait, that's not a. Marvel yeah, they did it. it again. Well, the one guy bought Superman. Ah, never. Well, yeah. Ah. But that was the thing that freaked me out as a kid. It's like, what, last issue? Oh, it's going to be continued over in the Defenders. And then you'd read the Defenders, and all of a sudden, Gary Conway's doing these terrible stories. Oh. <laughs> that just don't make any goddamn oh, sense. And I just wanted to cry. The sun. Wait a minute, it disintegrated in the last issue of the He's last. a robot. <laughs> don't tell me about your butts. Oh. Uh, you a couple of butts. That's what I was freaking about. Now, as Joe? Geeking, oh, jeez, I was geeking. As, oh, yeah, I don't know how to do oh, this. What, what I wasn't about, freaking about anything. I was geeking I, on that. I don't know how to do this. What I talked about earlier, I can assemble a run of Burns FF. I can get Alpha Flight. They're doing a great job of exploiting, for want of a better word, the uh, Stan and Jack verse, as, <laughs> as I'm wont to call Marvel. Ooh. So... Even hey, else. hey, what about Ditko? Like I go, well, I haven't oh. got amazing... No, in I'm sentence. turning back into Bob Banner. Bob Banner! Ah, as Dr. Octopus said, I, I guess I got tired of fighting that Superman. Oh, jeez. <clears throat> Don't turn into that David Banner. Nah, never last. So the fact that a lot of this stuff is in print and is on Marvel Unlimited is, uh, is just... Fantastic, you know. If I if I want to find it just today, I had the urge. Of, I want to read Marvels. Don't know why. I just do. Yeah. Part of it was I think I was reading the good looking book. something in. Uh, well, it was probably the book Marvel Marvel uh, story. Marvel system or Marvel comics, the untold story. Kurt but music. Now it's told, so I'm gonna cross music it like music. It. What are you freaking on or geeking on books? Well, uh, ironically, yeah. I geeked Earth. during the freaking part, whether it was. Uh, no, known by everyone who's listening or not, so I guess now I'll have to freak. <laughs> but I don't know, man. Problems finding the next issue. Uh, I had up until I got to the comic store, yeah, which was. You've been gone too long, Butch. You're screwing it up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, well, I don't. You know, I have a, this is my. I'm new to the language, so. Uh, this is called a computer. <laughs> computer. What? Ooh, it looks like a notebook to me. We can use it to check out all sorts, of, like. Uh, eBay, what happened at San Diego Comic-Con next year, and porn, <laughs> lots of porn. What happened next year? Next year. Yeah, I guess when I was getting started as, as a kid, I would often have one part of a two-part story. Oh. Didn't matter if it was the first or second part, it was a hella frustrating. And, uh, hell. but that, man, I'm telling you, that went away when I got to a comic store. I missed a couple issues here and there, but even then, even when you missed them, Within a week or two, you could go to the shelf and buy them for an inflated price, and at least you could still have them. If you're lucky, you run down to the Shinders. Because, John, there was one right downtown. Yeah, that's Canada. right. Gruber and I always, even when we started buying at Hot Comics, we'd make that trip. We'd stop yep. at the, the main store, and then we'd hit Shinders just in case we missed something. Or we knew, hey, this diamond thin thing's pretty hot. And then you would wonder how, how that guy who went, oh, I like a Superman, would get from one store to the other before you. How did he do that? I thought he had some kind of a warp field that he went through. How about you, Corey? What are you geeking on? Marvel Watch. When I was, during that time, I was geeking on the fact that they were just, it felt like comics were just expanding. You had um, 
all of these new characters showing up. You had all of these new Full things Full killer, happening. Ego, the Living Planet. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to name them all. You had all the Kirby stuff, but then you also had Gerber, Gerber. doing all this weird stuff in his books. And then you had Master of Kung Fu was like... Maybe Gerber. Kung Fu? martial arts and spies and everything felt felt like it was exciting and and you couldn't wait to know what would happen next and they had the formula down of what Stan always called the illusion of change it felt like things were changing but in the end they all stayed the same I think now we're more cynical about it that, oh, yeah, yeah, Captain America's turned evil because they've warped reality. He'll be back. Right, Parker right. Being Iron they won't Man. believe anything. Dr. Doom being Iron Man, killing the Hulk. They won't believe anything. They but, reversed I mean, that they, fast, didn't they? They could do a story where Dracula kills Doctor Strange, and you're like, holy crap! To be continued in the next issue. And, and then you never find it. Holy crap! <laughs> but you'd also... There was this sense that they were making it up as they went along. And after talking to creators that, from that time, most of them were. <laughs> Steve Gerber sure. would throw stuff in, and it's like, I don't know where I was going with that. Like the elf with the gun. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> he didn't know what he was doing with it. We'd sit down, and we'd get baked on some weed, and then we'd start writing comics till 4 in the morning. The elf yeah, with the gun was, was in Defenders. <laughs> yeah, Englehart and Starlin were just like, God, ah, that sounds cool. <laughs> and there was a sense of just throwing crap in and figuring it out later. Things are more planned now. Yes, it's, it's, it's structure's better, but I miss those days of creators just, yeah, throw that in. Let's see what happens. So do I dare ask, what the hell? When, you, when, when did Marvel Comics jump the shark for you? Um... My opinion, when Shooter took over. Wow. I lasted it longer. Went, it went from anything can happen to, oh, okay, this is an issue. 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 And the, it was a the, steamroller roller full speed ahead at that point for, for me. me yet. It was. And a lot of it was even the page designs were boring. It's six-panel grids. Everything was a six-panel grid. You know, you had some artists who played around with it. Buscema played around with it. Sal Buscema was still doing cool stuff. You know, but a lot of the artists had to stick to that six-panel grid, and a lot of them were just hacking it out. See, for I, I defy anybody to read Amazing Spider-Man 210 to 220 and think that those comics are any good at all. Oh, man, I was, oh. I was so hot on that book at that point. Yeah. For me, it was later. Oh, really? That kid. Moon Knight story? That Moon Knight story, huh? I, that made no sense I, I, at all. Come on, I think oh, that was 221. When Moon Knight come out? Oh, my God, I can't believe it, Moon Knight! Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, but then yeah. Moon Knight shows up in Spider-Man. Oh, cool, this Moon Knight book's really experimental. Eh. Yeah. See, for uh, me, uh, it was the 90s when I had the yeah. cast store, and, you know, we've talked about this. Everything was just editor-driven. I... To me, the X Men did not exist because I just did not read them. It was just a blank. Right on. Like I said, they didn't seem like they were part of the Marvel universe. How about you? Did you they, when they jump for you, Butch? Here's what happened. It didn't jump the shark, but it was on its way when they pulled that one more day deal where they <laughs> they uh, negated Mary Jane yeah, yeah. and Peter Parker's wedding because that pretty much brought me back to the day I started reading comics and made. All of it not count. <laughs> and uh, oh, there was something else in that period. Uh, what was after Spider? You could not have given that oh, book the finger harder. Yeah, it was Civil War. Yeah, Civil War. It, Civil War. I loved, but as they began to undo Civil War, where like you know the registered heroes thing wasn't a big deal anymore, yeah, and exactly. people who were at war with each other were now hanging out together again and stuff. That I didn't. That cheapened the effect of Civil War. Uh, Pete, come on. When Spider Man unmasked, that was great stuff. Oh, we're all it was like thrilling. That. Yeah, you know. But the, but it really never jumped the shark till this last uh Secret War it was the big wheelie deal where they ended the universe. I, w I was reading the Avengers and I was just going, Well, there's no way to get out of this. I mean everybody's everything's just thing, done yeah. and, and who cares? They talked you know? about they did that twice before. They did it yes. in Doctor Strange. Yep. 
And what was the other book? Which I'm cool with. What if uh, Korvac had... What? No, what are you were, doing? Don't touch my... <laughs> there were two, two books about the same time. In oh, the every 70s. issue of What If. It was pretty much that. So they talk about... It was like two different books. The Marvel Universe ended and got put back together again. The first being... Now I'm surprised Strange, it was only two. I can't think of the other one. But if you read Marvel Comics, the untold story... Yep. It's in there. The story's told. Yes. Well, believe it or not, kids... You've listened to us blather on about funny books for an hour and a half. Fill in funny books. Yep. And if we don't F up again, you may never hear another fill in. (laughs) Oh, no. We'll always want to hear this one one or two in the chamber. (laughs) Because things will screw up. This one probably never see the light of day. Yeah. Two minutes later. later, Yeah. Hey, the last one we had lasted a few months. And the one we did in December lasted until, I think, March or April or something. You know, until Corey has a mental breakdown. Corey until hasn't Corey, done that you know, <laughs> Until somebody screws with well, Corey's head enough that he goes, I can't Trump talk. Get, so you're, you're doing okay now. Have you accepted President Trump? <laughs> oh, God. President Trump, yes, President Trump. Whatever you say, President. Don't worry. I uh-huh. a President Camacho. Oh, President, President Clinton? Who? That'll never work. Never last. And as we say oh, every week, uh, t- every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the most, Joe. Enough said. Done, bitches.